about it. Okay, very good. So good to see you, George. Welcome very much. And in the audience, welcome very, very much to Conversations. It's a great pleasure to welcome to the program uh, George C. Stoney. And George C. Stoney is a film or filmmaker, and I would add at the very outset, I having been at a screening of his work that's been put on down at New York University in this November of 2010, um, a, a filmmaker extraordinaire within a certain context, uh, and he's also known widely as one of the major figures that put together interest in societal terms in this institution of uh, p public access for which we congratulate you on all of that and welcome Thank you. George. Pleasure to welcome you to the set. Oh, glad to be here. We're going to talk, we're going to show a couple clips of your work okay. and then we're also showing, we're going to show another clip of your work that you're currently engaged in. But could you maybe just share in a, in a quick kind of way uh, your background, born and raised, that sort mm -hmm. of thing, and how you got involved mm -hmm. with media and then we want to talk about filmmaking and, and your work and then also get some talk in about the significance of public access as an institution. But could you share your background, please? Yes, I'm from uh, North Carolina, mm -hmm. Winston-Salem. Uh, I'm 94 years old yeah. and uh, I was born and reared in North Carolina and was there, went to Chapel Hill, the University of North Carolina, mm -hmm. and uh, hardly left the place. Uh, until uh, after I finished college, hmm. but I've been up here most of the time since. Right. You've been at New uh, NY University Tisch School of the Arts. I've been uh, at Tisch School of the Arts since 1970. Somebody wants to know. I hear that uh, you're 94. You look uh, 54 <coughs> in very real terms. You're doing very well. Congratulations on Thank that. Thank you. That's a good deal of lifespan to get so much of your work into. I don't it. feel 54. I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> know the feeling well, sir. Yeah, 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 right. But you got involved in film early, and you were doing films. Uh, uh, you were interested in, in media also. The Canadian Film Board was of interest to you and this sort of thing. And you're, you're talking now in the 40s and 50s, and maybe you could fill out... Yeah. When did you get involved in film and so forth? Well, I got involved in films uh, <clears throat> right after I got through with the Army. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, in 46. Uh, I see. Uh -huh. uh, a college friend of mine, Nick Reed, mm -hmm. uh, had worked with the, the National Film Board of Canada for a couple of years, mm -hmm. and he got a uh, Rosenwald grant uh -huh. to... Uh, to set up a unit to help to help nonprofit agencies and government agencies uh, make films that would uh, help them serve their their constituency better. Very good. Yeah. And uh -huh. uh, he needed somebody who knew something about farming because he had contracts with uh, agricultural agencies. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't know much about farming. Yeah. But I had worked for two years after the war mm -hmm. with the Farm Security Administration. Okay. And I knew something about uh, agriculture bureaucracy. Wow. <laughs> which turned yeah. out to be a, uh, much more useful. Yes, indeed. If you can understand bureaucracy, you're in pretty good shape in the modern world, aren't you? There's a lot of it, yes. Uh, uh. And, I, um, and I lived in the country for a couple of years as a child. Mm -hmm. My mother died when I was five, and really? my oh. father struggled yeah. uh, manfully to look after uh, four children. Yes. And finally, he kind of farmed us out to a, a good, uh, solid old farm family. Right. And so we lived there for two years. So you gained values there of the land yes. and yes. so forth, yeah. and the rural setting and that sort of thing. Yeah. It must have been difficult uh, for it you to was. get through college and so forth. Did, was there the GI Bill or anything that would help out, or was that of an issue or not? Uh, you, you you got to college after you, your your time in the in the in the United States Army, right? Or yeah, uh, no, yeah, uh, before that. Oh, I see. Okay, yes. yeah. So it must no. have been difficult, or was it difficult to get through and get a college degree and everything, given well, the fact yes, that things uh, were tight. In fact, uh, mm -hmm. I had a my father's uh, was uh, struggling. Yeah. Uh, 
he'd been a preacher and mm -hmm. uh, the congregation didn't uh, like the kind of uh, uh, quiet, patient uh, Christianity that he represented. They wanted hellfire damnation. I see. Yeah. So uh, mm. <coughs> he, he quit the, the ministry mm -hmm. and struggled to sell vacuum cleaners and uh, brushes and that kind of thing. To make his way. Yeah. And he, he had a hard time. Yeah, right. So uh, uh, he couldn't send me to college. But you but went to Chapel Hill. I went to the University of North Carolina. Uh -huh. I had a paper route, so uh -huh. went, uh, and I saved some money. Good for you. But yeah. uh, and uh, somebody came to my high school mm -hmm. and said that it was possible to work your way through. Really? Okay. And uh, so I hitchhiked down to Chapel Hill. Right. And. Uh, 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 went to his office, mm. and he said, well, uh, <clears throat> we we're, have people working in the dining hall, cleaning it up and scrubbing down the floors, yeah. and at least while you're here, mm. uh, we, can give you uh, we can give you food, and you can sleep in a, an abandoned uh, uh, dormitory. They should make a movie of your life. <laughs> <laughs> Dickens and Dick and so I did that. Horatio Alger, yes. But and, uh, uh -huh. th that didn't pay my tuition. No, right. Uh -huh. But at that time, they let you uh, go go in debt for your uh, yeah, tuition. Right. It was yeah okay. Uh -huh. So uh, I the the four years were hard, were difficult. Yeah, you worked your way through college. Yeah, that's they say. right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's it. Good. Was possible then. Yeah. It's not possible, possible. now. I know. It's surely yeah. changed, hasn't yeah. it? Entirely, the whole thing. I, yeah. I blush to think mm -hmm. what the the parents of my students yes. are paying to have them in my class. I know. Sometimes I I've got thirty uh, fifty four in my uh, images of the 30s and, and uh, uh -huh. class and uh, the documentary tradition classes. Yes. And sometimes I look up at those students and I think what they're paying to be in my class. Right. And I think to myself, George, you fraud. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have? What do you have that could possibly be worth what they're paying yes. <laughs> to oh, be in this room. And that bespeaks a very good attitude <laughs> in terms of the human condition. You're very concerned with the, uh, uh, with the difficulties of some of the least advantaged among us, as Mr. Roosevelt asked that we ought to do, if I'm not yes, mistaken. And, yes, and uh, mm -hmm. I wish that we had the New Deal yeah. attitude, mm -hmm. which uh, helped me get through school because mm -hmm. uh, the New Deal agencies uh, helped us uh, get through get through college. And I would warrant some of those things that were part of the, the legacy of the New Deal would have been the subject matter of your early film activity with your colleague from the, the Canadian Film Board. That's right. Because they and were even, even more recently, mm -hmm. I had a course which I created at NYU called Images of the 1930s. Wonderful, yeah. And the main assignment in that class is that the students do the history of their own families during the 30s. And that you always gets them much closer to, not only to their families, right. but to historical facts. Right, right, right. I mean, when you say image, you mean like photographs and so forth? When you're saying image, we're thinking of uh, <coughs> visual, uh, visual representation. Uh, yeah. uh -huh. You see, uh, there have been a lot of documentary films made about the 30s. Yes. Yeah. And I assemble those, mm -hmm. and they that's the the background for the class. I see. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And I know we used to have, I was from Michigan, and so we used to have, every house used to have what they called an attic. Yeah. It was a yeah. place where you could yeah. just stick stuff. Yeah. And we had magnificent photographs where we had some from the turn of the century in the old family tradition, mm -hmm. so it's wonderful to pull those out and get them. And you put, you've used a lot of those images in terms of some of the films that you've... Uh, that you've put together. Yes, I have. Uh huh. Uh huh. And you've done it magnificently. I'd like to say they're celebrating your your life's work at, at NYU this very week and so forth down at NYU, and uh, they're showing films. And I've been able to get to a couple of those screenings, and I was really impressed 
with how well you put together films. And that would have been within a context of 16 millimeter, or, or it was actual film, because young people won't realize there were no camcorders or no video or sure, any of right. those kind of things. It was a process of film, and it was very, uh, it was very labor, it, it was very, it was very challenging and to put expensive. together good films, framing and lighting and all of that had to be sort of done and at expensive. the season. And expensive as well, yes, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So we took, I think we took much more care <coughs> uh -huh. of what we shot at that time. Yes. That's why the lighting of uh, camcorders uh, is just as demanding as the 16 millimeter lighting. Okay, but, yeah. But uh, since 16 millimeter costs so much more, right. we took much more care about it. Ooh, and I right. wish that I could get my students uh, when they when they shoot documentary films, uh -huh. to take the kind of care that we did. Everything. Do you think it's part of a general attitude of the zeitgeist or something that everything's moving so fast now with the computers that are coming? Uh, it's very difficult. I was just saying, the the computers are coming and the, the changes and the image manipulation and the ability to deal with images. It's just going exponential in terms oh. of everybody in the world. Little camcorders <coughs> can make television and so forth. And so it's changing so quickly. And you constantly have to keep up with the, the new devices. Well, I, you try. At I my age, I can't do it. <laughs> I need a seven-year-old or somebody to and, give me lessons. And I'm, I'm exactly with you there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wish I could, could um, move through the, all the technology as fast as the junior high school kids. I, I know, see. It's, it, it really is amazing. They learn, it's like a language. We learn how to talk at our mother's knee, and they just learn these electronic devices <laughs> and it's second nature. Yes. And that's very encouraging yes. because that's the way, the way it's moving. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you started with, your, uh, with these films that you were making, and we're going to show clips of a couple of those, right? Um, you had some political ideas. You were, you've always been concerned with, as I say again, the least among us, which I think is a great moral uh, position to take in the universe, not enough of that. But you've had that. But then you've also had challenges to let people know about some of these agencies. That was a focus of a great deal of what you did that were in certain ways benefiting the population and that sort of thing. You had an overall vision, or did they come in terms of Department of Health would say we want to get a film about cholera in our na or, or some particular subject. How did it come? The various films ideas that you selected to put your attention to uh, manifest. Uh, how did it work? Well, uh, <coughs> almost all the films that I've made mm -hmm. have been commissioned in one way or okay, another. Okay, that's what I guess I was yeah, getting at. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. They and and uh, so. The, each of them had a purpose. For yeah. example, the, probably the best known film I've made is called All My Babies. Yes. Uh -huh. And that uh, was designed by the, for the, the Georgia Public Health Department mm -hmm. through the Public Health Service uh -huh. to educate uh, midwives, okay. right. usually semi-literate midwives right. in the South. Okay, right, uh-huh, yeah. Well, that, that, that's the kind of thing that would be very useful. Also, okay. you're able to pass on information uh, without uh, reading, without, without a linear perception. I mean, the, the, we, as we walk through the world, uh, we are experiencing everything multisensorially. Mm -hmm. You know, everything is coming <laughs> sensorially, and right. we're getting back to where we were for a long time. We only had print as a way of re conveying information, mm -hmm. and some paintings and so on. But now we're getting down to where we're mimicking the way we've experienced the world multisensorially, and the film and the audio and so forth is part of that. And you were, in, you were involved in that. In your university training, were you trained that way, or did you pick it up... Uh, after doing liberal arts, or how did you get there? Well, I was, was trained as a journalist. You were a journalist, okay, yes. right. And my first job out of the Army mm -hmm. was working with the Raleigh News and Observer. Okay, as a reporter? As a reporter. Print? And Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. and then moving on from there, mm -hmm. I got a, uh, a wonderful job mm -hmm. with the Farm Security Administration okay. as a press officer. A press officer, and then you did press releases on things that the public should know about what they're making and, available. And yeah. also, mm -hmm. I helped 
our uh, uh, agency members to put out their press releases. Mm -hmm. I wrote uh, model press releases where mm -hmm. they could fill in the gaps. Okay. And also, uh, I, because the radio, yes, radio was, was coming, becoming yeah. very was was. This is in, in the th in the forties. Yes, uh -huh. the late forties. Mm -hmm. Radio was the Dominant local uh, instrument. Okay. Uh, reaching out to, <coughs> uh, particularly the Farm Security Administration was reaching out to semi-literate and illiterate people. Right. Okay. And uh, so I would make model programs mm -hmm. uh, for them. A template. And it was like, interesting that. Yeah. That was my first experience with something like public access. Yes. Uh -huh. That is, I would encourage the, our farm agents mm -hmm. to bring on the program mm -hmm. um, model farmers. Real people. Real people. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. uh, and they found that uh, when they put real people on In the front screen, of the microphone or on the screen uh, and, later, yeah. Or, and uh, they mm. would, on, well, on, on, on the microphone. Yes, not, right, <laughs> right, a tape, yeah. yeah. Audio the, tape and then video, yes. uh, not video, uh, yeah, when, film. Mm. When they were speaking to neighbors, mm. to neighbors to neighbors, it meant something. Yeah, they could special. relate to what somebody That's like right. themselves were involved. And uh, they were, didn't have to be literate then. Right, 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 right. For example, uh, we had a, uh, a program of, of advice for the, the farm families mm -hmm. of, uh, about how to balance their, their uh, diets. Right. And so the, the farmer and the farmer's wife would come on together and uh, the farmer would, uh, would describe how he selected uh, not only his cash crops, uh -huh. but what he uh, what he put in his home garden. Okay. And then the wife would talk about how she preserved the stuff, mm -hmm. put it into the what they call these pressure cooker. Yeah. Which well. they call the precious cooker. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, yeah. uh, well, they get the alliteration. And then the, yeah. I would bring I would bring in a still. Uh huh. Uh, <laughs> which they then would talk to no, they could and describe yeah. uh, how many uh, dozen uh, quarts of beans they put up yeah. and, and uh, tomatoes and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. And they were speaking then to other mm -hmm. farmers like themselves. Uh -huh. oh. And that was my first uh, experience yeah. with the which led eventually to public access. Okay, that's really that's really interesting, yes. and lots of dimensions. That's interesting because, like, I, I'm thinking if your education's a big interest mm -hmm. and everything, and the the one thing that uh, that <coughs> it's moving so quickly now, and uh, like we say, you don't have to be taught to talk. Mm -hmm. Everybody learns to talk environmentally with their mother's knee. Everybody learns how to talk. And as you walk through the world, you can talk, and you're experiencing things, you're communicating with people in the real world in a multisensorial way and everything. And, and so you can communicate things like that. And now we're getting to be where all kinds of things, like your thing where you're explaining with the people what was going on, the medium was there for you to be able to, exp to, to communicate in a way that wasn't available to mm -hmm. humanity until the very recent time. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's, it's, getting, it's moving very quickly that way. And uh, the, in multimedia, it's getting closer to the way in which we experience the world. And they can present all kinds of ideas in very, very uh, vivid and very important and, and communicative form and so forth without any written words at all. Mm -hmm. It can be written in the way that you do when you communicate. And I think that's taking place on a world scale that has huge implications in terms of the connection, Marshall McLuhan used to talk about, the connection of the, of the extension of our consciousness and communication is now coming around almost full term. And, and we're coming into a new way of relating to uh, education and all matter of communication that's similar to the way we experience the world as we walk around.
I don't know if you can understand. It, the only way to pass it on over the long period in the past was through print or through a linear perception. Mm -hmm. And now you're experiencing it multisensorily all at once the way we do when we walk around in the world. And the film made it possible to make things real in that sense. And I think it has big implications for the, implica for the evolution of human society, the way we're going to be communicating. I, I, I'm sorry, I got off on a sidebar. But that's wonderful, the idea that you put it. Did, you say, did they understand when you said you brought a still? Did you, you brought a still? Uh, uh. A pressure, a pressure cooker, yeah, yeah. a pressure. But you brought a still. You could make some white lightning if you <laughs> wanted to, and that sort of thing. You're talking to real people, is what yes, I'm saying. Right, yeah, right. and you can get down into that, and that's uh -huh. really good. And you enjoyed that process oh, yes. and being with the people. And you're very, you're very democratically oriented in your, in your moral or ethical perception. You're democrat. You like the people. I mean, you're you're in league. You're, well, you're not. You, you, so that bespeaks your interest uh -huh. in public access uh -huh. because public access is a way of communicating for the people rather than just the hotshot stars that are in right. all the ads and all yeah, the feature right. films yes. and so forth, you know. And yeah. at the Farm Security Administration, we yes. were reaching out to other poor farmers. Right, okay. Okay, that was good. And you, you, That's where you got started with that, right? Yes. Well, that's really good. Now, what we're going to do, George, we're trying to cover a lot here today because we, uh, we're also going to say they're going to be offering, um, you're working still on film. We're going to show a couple clips of film that you have. Okay. I think one of them we had to do, you've done how, ma how many films, I asked you the other night, you couldn't quite recall, but how many films have you made over your life's career or something? I Would don't you? know. Okay. I remember yeah. that all of my films uh -huh. have been cooperations. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I I've never made a film all by myself. Okay, you think it's inherent that film is a, a collaborative medium? It, film is is almost inevitably a collaborative feeling. In the feature film world, the property is what counts first. It's the writing, is the mm -hmm. writing and so forth. That's important to making the films that you made and so forth. Was you had a structure similar to making a film in the film industry and so forth? Oh, you have yes. a property uh, you begin with uh, and, every, and an idea. Uh, the, the idea of verite mm -hmm. in which you just stick up a camera, Yeah, that never makes a very good film. Okay, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. you, you almost always stick up your camera with some purpose in mind. Okay, right. And certainly when you put it together, uh -huh. you, you have to uh, arrange material so that the audience right. gets something other than just a view of reality itself. Right. Yeah. We're moving toward reality TV. I don't even know quite what it is, but I understand that a lot of people are worried the actors are losing their jobs now because the reality TV seems to be part of the current situation. Yes. But what we want to get to, you got two clips, don't we? You brought in a couple of clips. Mm -hmm. And maybe in the control room they could set that up. And uh, we're going to have a couple of clips, each one around three or four minutes, something like that. Okay. We're going to run them both, and All we'll right. come back and talk about it. Okay. And then down the line, we'll give you a heads up in the audience. We're going to be showing a little clip from a film he's currently and been revolved with about a major uh, a Brazilian philosophical pedagogist and, uh, and philosopher, uh, uh, Paulo Ferrari. He's working on that now. But let's set that up in the, in the booth, if you can. Now, we're going to run a couple of clips. There'll be one right after the other. And we're talking with George Stoney, a filmmaker and uh, one of the major uh, uh, p people who helped create the institution of public access. We're going to want to get some words in about that at the end. But could we run that tape now then, if you could, please? Run the DVD. And uh, let's maybe we can just chat as we wait for them to get that. It'll come up. Here we go, maybe. Here we go. One night at Highlander, I can remember that uh, we were watching a movie when some men came in with guns and billy clubs and the power was turned off and we were in complete darkness. There we were, uh, some of us, of us barely knowing each other. And unknowing of what 
it was that was happening and going on. So there was a lot of fear in the room. But as the men walked around between us with their guns and their billy clubs, somebody decided to sing, We Shall Overcome. She's the one who got the idea. She started humming, We Shall Overcome, and that got everybody humming together. And then they just started singing. And for about two hours, that actually quieted some of the terror and fear that people had uh, of what these deputized thugs were doing. Uh, there seemed to be a need to say to the men, we are not afraid. And those lines helped convince us that we were not afraid. Jamila was a wonderful singer, probably about in her early teens. And that night when they raided Highlander, she sat there in the dark and made up the verse on the spot, We Are Not Afraid, and helped about 50 people there sing in the dark, We Are Not Afraid, and sing We Shall Overcome, just to keep their spirits up while the deputized thugs went around and ransacked everybody's luggage. It unnerved them. One of the men turned uh, to me with his flashlight as he shone it in my face and said, very nervously, if you have to sing, do you have to sing so loud? And that statement just raised my voice even higher. We are not afraid today. And everybody just seemed like nature came into that room. The water on the outside and even the trees just picked up. And we were just a part of that nature, in tune to what was happening. So much so that it unnerved them. And they began to even back up. Even though they arrested some of the people they pretended or alleged were selling uh, illegal booze, uh, they retreated very nervously and had to leave. So I remember getting on the stage for the first time and I was like, oh God, I closed my eyes. I said, well, here it goes. And I came out and I got into character and I said, gentlemen, and everything was quiet. It was like the most quiet. And I said, I got them. And that's when I said, you know, like, I went on from there, and I knew they were listening. So I just looked at the lights, and I just didn't see anybody, and I recited my poem. I begin to say with seeming madness. Gentlemen, I begin to say with soothing manners, not you today. I offer you the good life with the drop of strife. Diamonds, pearls, girls, the best of all worlds. A dream is just a dream if you can't chase it down. I am the dream merchant. Close your eyes and see what I sell. Remember, remember your struggles. All the little problems you just can't juggle from the rent not being paid to you not getting laid. You need the cash, the green, the pure cheddar. Accept my offer. You better. Don't worry, the dough you stack it. Money made from this little packet. Manteca, pea funk, the jump better than the skunk. The cane, the strain, the membranes through the veins. Insane, insane. I tell you, I sell you a dream in vain. It comes with the sweet seductress. Dressed to impress in that hip hugging red dress. She has the bedroom eyes, the luscious lips and the long, luxurious hair. Her body whispers, make love to me if you dare, if you dare. You will abide, take a trip to the other side in a nice fat ride. A Jeep, a BM, a Benzo, all will see you with mucho respeto. This dream that I deem will raise your self-esteem, complete with the wardrobe. Italian cut shoes, suits by Armani, custom made from Garmani. 
It goes with the presidential, which is essential. It fulfills your mental. So if this dream is your goal, you pay with your soul. And that was the beginning of, uh, that's poetry, in the beginning of uh, what is called rap and so forth, in a very real sense, or poetry slams and so forth. That was when he was in, in uh, Sing Sing Prison. Oh, really? Okay. When we were, when we were shooting. Uh, the, the, that's where it was shot. The, uh, Catherine Vokens had has a had a drama group there. Oh, okay. Uh huh. And uh, he was uh, he was a part of that. Uh huh. And we're making a we're making a sequel to that now Are called you? Staying Out. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. And uh, we're showing how difficult it is when you've got a prison record. Yeah. How difficult it is to. Uh, to go legit, yeah, right. to get to, to get a job, mm. to keep a job. Right. They had the Fortune Society. Tries to help, I think. That's in right. That, but it's Fortune a real Society problem. Society does a very good job. And they've got a big now prison yeah. industrial yeah. complex yeah. that's yeah. been built up. Yeah. Large. It had yeah. to do a lot with uh, yeah. marijuana laws yeah. and so forth. That it seems to be societies coming around to recognizing that was a mistake. Right. To put that yeah. schedule <laughs> one. Right. So these are socially conscious things that you're doing mm -hmm. and everything. And congratulations on that. And it was very interesting. And then the the woman about the we shall overcome. That was beautiful. Who is that? Uh, Who is that? Camilla. Camilla. Yeah, she's beautiful. Yes, just uh, beautiful. Her yes, voice uh, is just. And you have to. Oh, okay. So that's really good. That's a couple of examples out of the Obra, which is huge, of things that he's yeah. done and so forth. And sort of while we're in that vein, maybe we could just sort of think about the other one because we're showing uh, films in a tribute to your work. Um, uh, at NYU this very week and so forth, and I'm glad they're doing that. And one is going to be, it's a little late for the viewing audience, but it's going to be actually tomorrow. You're going to be showing clips from a film that you've been involved with, and maybe you could share um, uh, about the philosopher or the philologist, or the... Um, uh, the, the, the um, philosopher. Philosopher, but also, what is it? Pa pedagogist. Pedagogist. Yeah, uh, Paulo Freire in, in Brazil. You spent a good deal of time there. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the man. And then we got a clip about a film, a, a piece from the film that you're, you've been working on and are still working on. But maybe you could share that and sort of set it up. Well, I went to Brazil mm -hmm. uh, as a part of the, the State Department's mm -hmm. uh, efforts to, uh, <coughs> to get American uh, academics uh, to help uh, universities abroad. Okay. And yeah. particularly... Well, in the early days when we were using video, okay, and uh, we thought we kind of <laughs> invented yeah. a, a use of video as a playback device, I remember, and uh, yeah. this clip uh, demonstrates uh, we were doing it. Uh -huh. uh, actually, <clears throat> when I was in Brazil, I demonstrated uh, our playback methods, and uh, Paulo. Uh, read about it because it was written up in, in the folio of Sao Paulo. I see. Uh -huh. And uh, he, I, I, maybe, maybe I, I tell about that in the clip, I can't remember. Okay, yeah, but, but uh, you were doing, you were using uh, like a camcorder or you, no, using you, you, a, we used to have a, a thing called old a, cam, uh, old, you remember a porta pack? Old, uh, an old porta pack. A porta pack, yes, yeah, yes. I know. And yeah, uh, that was when we first uh, got it. Yeah. And Paolo was, uh, who uh, uh, was just beginning to recognize uh, what the camcorder could do. Uh huh. And he wanted to know. He wanted to see more of the clips. Yes. Uh huh. Well, I had never heard of the guy. Yeah. Even though he was quite famous at what the time. What year, more or less, or roughly, are you oh, talking? Oh, fifteen about? years ago. Fifteen years ago. Yeah. Okay. And, right. Uh, okay. Uh huh. Uh, so, uh, they were so impressed with the fact that he called me up. Uh -huh. So we actually have a clip of uh, our first meeting. With him, yeah. Yes. Yeah. But a little more, if we could, on him. Now, he's a major figure. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, Phenomenology he's associated uh, with, and he's, yes. got, he's, he's got some he's, oppression of the poor uh, or something. He's written many, many books, but yes. his, perhaps his, his earliest one, 
and perhaps best known is the pedagogy of the oppressed. That's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the teaching of the oppressed. I yeah. mean, pedagogy is a way of teaching. And, uh, and so you've become interested, you, you spent a considerable amount of time in the country of Brazil, up in the Northeast, as I understand. Uh, I went to the Northeast uh -huh. and, and worked with him for a, a, a while. Uh -huh. And so our film has some recordings of uh, uh, early experiments that uh, Paolo was, was doing using uh -huh. the camcorder. Using the cam, yeah. so he, it was inter his interest in the technology. That's right. I can remember doing programs back in those days. You remember Paul Ryan and Rain Dance? And oh, the yes. Uh -huh. God bless him. They were friends, and he had a porta pack. He had about the sixth or seventh that came off the yeah. boat from Japan with Nam June Pike and everything. And uh, he, he, he was very interested in, 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 in that. And uh, I can remember the, the, those early days with that, with that porta pack. It's very interesting because it's a whole new. And also, we had done a program along about the same time. Did you ever happen to know Peter Goldmark, Sr.? I didn't know him. I just know the name. There's Peter Goldmark. His son, I guess, was head of the, uh, what do you call it, the, um, the um, New York Authority or something, you know, the uh, Port Authority. Mm -hmm. But he was the inventor because it, we didn't have it until it made possible that he, he was the inventor of uh, videotapes. We didn't have videotape before. I didn't know this that. This would be before the porta pack, mm -hmm. of course, and he invented the videotape. Mm -hmm. He had a very nice lady secretary, Molly, Polly, and everything. But uh, the invention, the point being is these new technologies were coming, how new they are, I guess, in a certain sense. We didn't have videotape much before we had the porta pack, and that's been not that long. Uh, and it, it, was, it, was, it was one inch. Oh yeah, they had that after. Yeah, we had well, no. We had mm. the first uh, mm. the the first videos mm -hmm. were one inch. Yeah, right. And were used mm. by uh, the television stations. Yeah, yeah. Two inch high beam tape. That's there. right. Yeah. And now then we, we got the one one inch. Uh huh. And that went. Uh, yeah. In uh, non professional setups. Yeah, right. And then finally three quarter. Yeah, right. And finally the porta pack. Yeah, right. It came from Japan. Okay, well, anyway, we're talking about in the, uh, a pioneer in this field of uh, video and so forth and filmmaking. They're sort of sister communities. But maybe we could set that up and air that uh, clip now. Um, and I guess that runs about three or four minutes, mm -hmm. something like that. And we're talking again with George Stoney. And we're getting sound on the thing. Uh, I'm not sure if there's something mistake being made or something. Um. I strongly Did believe. Is what is that? I I never could think of the inexistence of God for even one second. Nevertheless, more and more, I don't feel too much the need for a church in order for me to discover God. Because above all for me, the, the true temple of God is your body, mm. is my body, is our bodies. I am sure that one, one of the things we should ask every day to ourselves is, why am I here? Mm -hmm. And the, with whom am I? With whom I fight? And against whom I fight? Mm -hmm. What is my dream? In favor of what must I be in the in history mm -hmm. the more i ask questions like this the more i i perceived uh, the need i had to be consistent with my friendship with christ for mm -hmm. example your friendship with christ yes with ah, christ no that's... it is an arrogance maybe oh, no that's a beautiful phrase yeah not fear of christ <laughs> A cultura é tudo o que nós fazemos no mundo, com o mundo, sobre ele, em torno dele, através do nosso trabalho. O trabalho 
não importa apenas físico, que não existe, do trabalho chamado intelectual, do trabalho chamado, chamado manual. E nesse sentido também, cultura tanto é uma sinfonia de Beethoven, a criação de Bach, de Vila, de Vila Lobos, como é uma cacimba que o camponês, por necessidade, cavou no chão. Se nós discutirmos com as classes populares o conceito de cultura, nós poderemos mostrar, evidentemente, que se é possível a nós, enquanto homens e mulheres, transformar um mundo que não fizemos, por que então não é possível mudar o mundo que fazemos, que é o mundo da cultura e o mundo da história? Quando eles descobriram o que era cultura, eu percebia nos olhos deles, nas caras deles, uma espécie de alívio centenário. É, é como se estivessem sacudindo para fora uma, uma pedra de cima do ombro que há, há séculos repousava neles. E eu percebi o gosto da briga, o gosto da luta para, para superar o obstáculo. On Sunday, outside of church, about the only entertainment we had was to take pictures, maybe go up to the cemetery or out in the mill yard and take pictures with a Kodak. That's a, a black lady, Aunt Eliza. She washed for my grandmother when my grandmother's children were small. And then when my mother grew up, she would come over and wash for us. In the early 30s, there weren't any black women in the mill at that time. They did not hire black women in the mill. And we worked for the people that worked in the mill, the, the mill villages. And we took care of their house, took care of the children, and did their work while they worked mm -hmm. in the mill. That's what, that was our occupation at that time. They didn't have to pay them very much. They just practically raised the children. You could take your black hands and you could stir it in their dough or in their foods. And uh, you could take your black body and lay in the bed with the child and, and protecting it. But you couldn't come in their front door, right? You weren't worthy to come in, your fr in their front door. We had uh, black domestic help, poor as we were. Uh, of course, the blacks being on the bottom of the social ladder at that time, there was no place they could work except, they couldn't work in the mill, by the way. Um, they couldn't come past a bail breaker, I don't believe. I went to work at, when I was 13 years old to Modena the cotton mill. That was around about 1926, somewhere along in there, I think, right about that time. I uh, worked in the warehouse. We never did get to run no machine, though. <laughs> no way, we didn't get to run no machine. Were there any black spinners or weavers or loom fixers back then? No. No, I did not want not in the mail where I would. Did you ever wonder why there wasn't? I don't know. Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> wonder why. Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you wonder why? I've, I have a pretty good idea. Well, why? They wanted to save the jobs for the white man. All right. <laughs> That's what I think. I just let you say it first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, I'm afraid that was what it was. Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. Okay, okay. That, that, those two fit together beautifully. <laughs> what a beautiful man, Ferrari. Yeah. Beautiful man. Yeah.
and thoughts of wisdom. And it's also, it just builds in nicely, because now you're talking about uh, the people, and you had this piece that fit nicely in with it, be, it that bespeaks your interest in the people and yeah. the democracy and uh, serving all the people. The wisdom is coming out of the yeah. ordinary people. <laughs> right. And that's what public <coughs> access is, could it gives us an opportunity to do. It is exactly that. And yeah. that's why you became interested in it. It came out of your work and your own, your own idea of ethics and that's so right. forth. Yeah. And it was a thing that you did. And you became involved in that and you were helping along with others. But you were one of the major figures who got in touch with uh, things in a, in, a <clears throat> in a practical way to get some real support by the cable industry mm -hmm. behind that part of what they do called public access. And I congratulate you on having done that and, and helping put it together because it's a major institution and its uh, example is one that is likely to emerge very, to be very important in the time ahead, it seems to me. You're a pioneer in that, but your thought on that, and it is because we can tap into the people themselves. It provides a way for them to produce multimedia and distribute it rather than only the stars, which the industry is by and large interested in. But uh, <clears throat> its continuation mm -hmm. depends on the franchise uh, uh, authorities, mm -hmm. the city franchise authorities, uh, uh, giving out the franchises. Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, for, uh -huh. it's, for example, with MNN, yes. uh -huh. uh, the requirements for public access mm -hmm. are written into the agreement. Yes, that's right. It goes back to about company. 1970, doesn't that's it? That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to continue that. Uh -huh. We also want to uh, ex uh, explain to the cable companies that by putting ordinary people and their interests on the screen, mm -hmm. uh, they're going to have many more loyal subscribers. Right. The same way as you use the example where the woman was talking about the precious cooker and so forth, uh, you have a person that a, a person can associate with because right. they're like their neighbor. They can understand it. And people do associate with that kind of thing. And you can have programming also that doesn't necessarily meet the uh, test of an advertising agency of so how many people have to see that program in order for it to be viable to sell cornflakes <laughs> rather than Wheaties, right, which right. Mo motivates the society right. at large. Right. And that this idea that the people matter mm -hmm. and there should be a place for the people to communicate and public access is one of those vehicles, particularly in a multimedia format, for them to be able to do that. That's right. Within cable, there's another one, there's C-SPAN. And C-SPAN has been, uh, Brian Lamb largely has mm -hmm. been the one who put together C-SPAN where they brought uh, the government and they have, the bo they have uh, three channels going now. And the cable industry, uh, Ted Turner and, and, and the people in the cable industry, in any industry, you've got all kinds of people from visionaries to bean counters in any organization mm -hmm. of human endeavor all the way. And there are many people within the cable industry when they think about what it is they're proud of, other than a number of channels with different programming uh, that they've been able to make available, is they, they count C-SPAN as the jewel in their crown. They all are proud of, for the cable industry, the people who mm -hmm. make it up. And they should be. And they should be because public, I mean, C-SPAN is a magnificent mm -hmm. service. And the other thing that they do support, the cable industry supports and has for about 40 years, is PEG, mm -hmm. Public Educational Governmental, mm -hmm. the public part of the PEG agreement between the cable industry and the societies, you know, in their numbers across the country, is public access. And that's something that it would be very well for them to perhaps see better than some do, the public relations value that it could be to the cable industry for having something mm -hmm. that is so democratic in an era where democracy is emerging that they're associated with it somewhat like the same way they take such pride in the, in the C-SPAN. Do you think, because that's the other thing that the cable industry supports for the public is the, is the outside of the normal mm -hmm. institutional structure of power and influence and so forth. And do you think there's an, a possibility that might dawn on greater numbers of people within the cable industry to whole, full, to whole throatedly support public access as a very important uh, expression of communication within our society. I wonder 
how you feel? Well, I think we have to constantly persuade them. Okay. We constantly have to bring it to their attention. Mm -hmm. We constantly have to make sure that our city councils yeah. uh, d demand that public access be a part of the cable uh, franchise. Uh -huh. <clears throat> As it is. As it, as it is been, now. Because some people will drag their feet on that, will they? That's or right. Not? Okay. Yes. And that's a problem. Yes. Okay. So we want to do that. I think what I was getting at is there would be people within the, within the cable industry who, if they could see that it would, say, a person who's thinking bottom line only or something, they would want to see uh, that cable, they, could, they could have value to them by being recognized as supportive of public access in a way that they do feel pride and give great support to C-SPAN. I'm trying to make a comparison between the two and that they might, instead of being reluctantly giving support to public access, they would full, full heartedly give support to it because they would add public relations value to their, to their, to their role in the society. Rather than saying, you must do it or something like that, they would see that it would be to their great advantage to give full support to it because it would be in keeping with the spirit of the, of the uh, agreement of the society in general for a democratic proposition of communication. That's what I'm sort of wondering, if that could dawn on more people who are maybe reluctant to give it full-throated full support. Well, I, I, th I think that uh, we should draw it to their attention. Okay. But uh -huh. we should never depend on that. Okay. We, we uh -huh. must make sure that it's, it's repeated and, and then the next time for the franchise agreements come up uh -huh. for renewal. Uh -huh. And let it be known that that is the, that is the responsibility. That's right. Then yes. that's the way the system is, uh, has yeah. been put together and so yeah. forth. Yeah. Okay, I know you've got an appointment to keep, I which have. is unfortunate. We're, we're getting into your time now, no. so I, it looks like maybe we're going to have to let you go here a little short of the end of the program. But um, I really thank you for that, and I know you have to keep that appointment. So um, I guess we'll have to force go four or five minutes here where we would have finished this out. But George, thank you very, very much for, uh, for all of your work as a filmmaker. You're, it's very well deserved uh, accolades that are being thrown your way this week at NYU. And that program with Paulo, Paulo Ferreira is really interesting. And, and then also for your work in terms of having set the groundwork for uh, public access, a, a major institutional communication system for the people of this country. And I thank you very much for that, you and all your colleagues. So. Thank you. Thank you. Your pleasure at the perception of a legend in public access and in filmmaking, George Stoney. And uh, we thank you. I uh, uh, invite you to come tune in, tune in tomorrow, next week. And we maybe we can show a little footage at the end to fill out the hour. And George, thanks a lot for coming thank in. You. It's a great pleasure talking thank with you. you. Shallow currents still take men to sea. And when the wind rises, though I may be safe for sure, I am transported back in memory to a small college movie house in North Carolina where Flaherty's Man of Aaron first filled me with awe and wonder. Flaherty's cast of characters were all islanders, born and bred. As a documentary filmmaker myself, I'm always curious and sometimes concerned about what happens to people whose everyday lives are transformed when they become part of a film. Tiger King was the island's blacksmith. Michaeline was a schoolboy of 12. And Maggie Duran, already a mother of four, knew only the hard life of a farmer's wife before Flaherty saw and photographed her at this same cottage door. We asked Harry Watt, who apprenticed with Flaherty and later directed some of Britain's most powerful wartime documentaries, to come back to Aaron with us. Maggie Midia. Yes. Oh, I'm sure. Beautiful as you ever. Very, very, <laughs> very, very Western front. You remember me, my I do God. very well. We've I not, do very we've well. We've not indeed. done badly, have we? Not, not at all, sir, not at it's all. It's a long time. It's a long time now. It's about, long it's, you it's, think? it's about now, I'd say. Forty years. Oh, God, yes, and more, I'd say. 
We were a grand young couple then, weren't we? That's that. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Will you come into the house? Uh, I'd like to very much. Yes, yes. come on and out. What are you doing? I'm trying to see what's stored up here, if anything. Are you right then, George? Uh oh. Yeah? My God, what is it? Well, looks it heavy. Yep, it is. But for God's sake, don't drop it then. Uh -huh. I got it. Moana. <laughs> Moana, yes. There's a story about the Flaherty girl oh, man, be careful, putting these them. things on and, and dancing for the Aaron Islanders. Is that so? Yeah. God, the Aaron Islanders must have been astonished. They're rather lovely, aren't they? they? Yeah. Lovely one. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> All right. There are a lot of up here. And I, I'm going to just do a bit of my Claudius now, if you don't mind. Oh! It's the holder for uh, Steinemann Rack. That's the Steinemann Rack. Uh -huh. Now that's what we uh, okay. we put the negative on. It's very heavy. Yeah, are you telling me? Yeah. What about? <laughs> you 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 put the. Do you realize you put your two hundred foot of negative around those, and then you 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 held it here, and worked it like that. Is that what you did? I'll say I did this for, for about hour after hour after hour. Um, and I never thought I'd see those again. Uh, you know, I thought I'd stop working for, for Man of Iron 45 years ago. Oh, you know what this is? I think this is the end of the great developing or printing like machine. Drying rack I mean drying rack, really, yeah. what I'm thinking of from the oh, drying the negative. Yeah. I think it's the end of it. Well, uh, and, uh, the, then... Like it up. The like it up here. <laughs> Why don't you leave them up there, George? For Christ's sake, I'm fed up. <laughs>